morning, the Lord be with you. And, and also, also with you. Welcome to all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today we celebrate the second Sunday in Lent. And the theme for this Sunday is with purpose on purpose. Before we begin, I have a, a few announcements to make. One, the tomorrow we have in-person elders meeting here at Faith, and we are going to do it here in the sanctuary. Again, we will follow COVID-19 safety protocols. The meetings will begin at 7 p.m. All elders are invited to come to this meeting and discuss the work that we do here at Faith and at Grace in Strasbourg. For Wednesday, we have our midweek Lenten service here at Faith at 7 p.m. And this service will be live streamed only. And the third announcement is regarding the following Sunday, March 7, here at Faith, that we will begin, with God's help, our in-person service at 10 a.m. So please keep in mind that we are following COVID-19 safety protocols and how many people we are allowed here in the sanctuary. It's going to be 60. So we will follow all those COVID-19 safety protocols. The live stream, I mean the service will be live streamed too for those members who are not ready to come to the church. And at Grace, God's willing, we are going to have our in-person service the following Sunday, March 14 at 10 a.m. If anything, we will let you know if something happened. We always, because COVID-19, we go day by day. So if anything happens, we will let you know, members at Faith and members at Grace. I guess we are ready to worship our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And at this moment, we we ask that we have a, a moment of silence to reflect in God's word in our life. We have come together to worship in response to our Lord's purposeful giving of himself for us on the cross. In the first stanza of these hymns, we consecrate to his purpose every gift he imparts. We sing, Lord, whose love through humble service.
name of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. At this moment, we are going to speak a little bit about the children's message, about the perfect timing of God. But before going to that theme, we are going to sing one hymn. Come follow me. follow me okay so we are going to speak a little bit <clears throat> about the timing of God the perfect timing of God and this we will use the epistle lesson one of the verse of the epistle lesson for today Romans chapter 5 verse 6 which, which says for while we were still weak at the right Time, Christ died for the ungodly. Isn't that wonderful? So we're going to speak about timing, but the perfect timing of God. And what I bring to you is some items that we use in baseball. I think you have played baseball before, no? If not, you have to start now. Anyway, so you see I have a glove, I have a bat, and I have a ball here that we resemble a real ball. But anyway, so we could use it as an example. So the perfect timing of God. But what is timing? Well, I look at the dictionary and the dictionary says it is the ability to select the precise moment for doing something for a good result. So I'm going to make an example about with baseball. You see the pitcher is in the mound getting ready to throw the ball to the batter or the hitter. And he gets ready, see all around him there a little bit, and he throws the ball. Sometimes that ball comes at high speed, sometimes it's a curve ball, or different kind of pitches. Anyway, so what happened, the batter. He's waiting for that ball, and he's ready to hit it. And the ball is coming. So the batter has to be ready when the ball is near to him, be able to hit it. If the timing is not right, what happened? The ball is caught by the catcher, and it could be a strike. Could be a ball if the ball is no good, so you don't throw it, it's no good. But anyway, so if you hit it, if you hit it at the right time, you could hit, you could hit a hit. <laughs> or a double, or a triple, or a home run, that, that's the best, a home run. You see, so that's a perfect timing. The pitcher throws the ball and you hit it at the right time. Anyway, so now, in the Holy Scriptures, in the Bible, God speaks about many things and timing. When Jesus came, 
on earth, that was the right time for all mankind, for all of us. That's wonderful. But God, before Jesus came, had to prepare a few things. I'm going to mention a few things only. Because there are a lot of things that God did in the Old Testament in order to prepare the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. He formed a people, Israel. There were many tribes and they all together. And then from that, Israel came Jesus Christ. Judah came Jesus Christ. Another thing that he did, as I said, there are many things to talk, but we, for, we don't have too much time, so we just mention a few things. Another thing is build a temple. You see, the temple needed to be there in order that the people of Israel make sacrifices, kill animals for their sins, to make propitiation that we said, or for the sins of, the, of, of them and for all of us. So that has to be ready. Temple and make sacrifices. And as well, when Jesus came, before three or four hundred, five hundred years before Jesus came, he prepared a people, a powerful people, an empire called the Greeks, the Greek. So what they did, they conquered around Israel and they brought their language, Greek, the Greek language, not the Spanish. Would be nice that, the Spanish, but no, it was not the Spanish, sorry. It was not German, sorry. And was not English, sorry, was Greek. So the people, when Jesus came, people, most of the people there around Israel spoke Greek. But anyway, after the Greek, who came another empire who defeated the Greeks? That was the Romans, the Roman Empire and they conquered more land around Israel. But they brought something important. They made vast roads, wonderful roads, that they'd be able to mobilize their troop or people from one place to another place in a short time. So that was great. Why? Because when Jesus came, he was able to travel easily to all that area, walk for sure, and proclaim God's word to the people. And when he died on the cross for our sins, the disciples and apostles were able to go to different areas quick and be able to proclaim, proclaim God's word in Greek or Jewish, if they were met Jewish people. But anyway, so those are the things that God prepared. So the right time of God to bring Jesus was the right time. 5,000 years. At the beginning, Adam and Eve fall from grace, and God promised a Savior. And you know, they have to wait 5,000 years. But Jesus came at the right time because God prepared everything for him to come. And then he died on the cross. And it's what Paul says here in our epistle, for while we were still weak, at the right time, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly, all the sinful people in the world. And now, we are waiting for Jesus, the second time, his second coming, and final coming. And that will be at the right time of God, not our time, at the right time of God, but Jesus will come. One day, a day that we don't know, but God is preparing everything now for him to come one day. So, it's wonderful that we rely on God because what he does, the plans of God is better than our plans, better than our ways. So God's timing is perfect and we thank God for that. Let us pray. Dear God, thanks for sending Jesus to die for our sins at the right time and give us eternal life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
We continue with confession and absolution. God established an everlasting covenant with Abraham. But our faith has waxed and waned, O Lord. Forgive our forgetfulness of your unchanging grace. David wrote, All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. But we have failed to remind one another of God's mercy and love. O oh Lord, forgive our hesitancy to share the news of your gracious presence. Paul wrote that because Christ died for the ungodly, we are justified by his blood. But we have tried to hide our sinfulness, O oh Lord. Forgive our blindness to the necessary sacrifice of your Savior. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God sent his Son into the world with one purpose, to save us from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the, by the death of his Son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we, shall we be saved by his life. As a call and ordained servant of Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We continue with the entrance. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. You who fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The, the Lord, Lord has remembered us. us. He, will he will bless us. us. He, he will bless, bless the house of Israel. Israel. He, he will bless, bless the house of Aaron. Aaron. He will bless those who fear the Lord, both the small and the great. We will, we will bless, bless the Lord from, from this time forth and forevermore. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the, Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Remember your mercy, O Lord, and your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. In peace let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace we have with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For peace among the families of the nations, and in coming generations, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all who rejoice here for our access by faith into this grace in which we stand, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. By your purposeful suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection, help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, who sent your Son into the flesh, so that he might pay for our sins and open eternal life to us, grant us strong faith so that we may purposefully take up our crosses and follow where he has led the way. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. <clears throat> the first reading for this morning is from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 to 7 and 15 to 16. God makes a covenant promise to Abraham. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, that I may make my covenant between me and you, and may multiply you greatly. Then Abraham fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer 
shall your name be called Abraham, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will, and I will make you into nations, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her. And moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall become nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. If anyone would come after me, let and him deny himself, himself and take up his cross and follow me. me. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the eighth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Truly, knowing Christ means following Him. We read the Gospel. And Jesus went on with His disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the, on the way, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that I am? And they told Him, 
John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others one of the prophets. And he asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Christ. And he strictly charged them to tell no one about him. And he began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed. And after three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. And calling the crowd to him with his disciples, he said to them, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the Gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and for faith his soul? For what can a man give in return for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of, of him will the Son of Man also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, you, O Christ.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text for meditation for this morning is from the Epistle of Romans, chapter 5, verses 1 to 11, which I read before. Dear friends in Christ, I think that most of you have watched an American football game. I do not know much about this sport, but what I have seen, what I know, is that the quarterback, that's his name, get the ball from the center player who passes or snaps the ball under his legs. The quarterback gets the ball and takes a quick decision on either to throw the ball or run with it. If the quarterback throws the ball to his teammate, who is the receiver, he has to do it at the right time in order that the receiver catch it. So the timing for getting the ball from the center and throwing the ball to the receiver has to be perfect, or well, almost perfect. My dear friends in Christ, so much depends on timing. That's an ever-recurring theme in our lives, individually, as well as together with others. It is an ever-present reality in many different settings. Family, church, work, school, society, sports, and the list could probably go on indefinitely. Proper timing helps to successfully drive through a series of green traffic lights in a large city without having to stop for a red one. Timing is also a strong biblical feature. For instance, the Apostle Paul wrote the Galatians about Christ's birth, Galatians 4 and 4. When the fullness of the time came, God sent for his son, born of a woman, born under the law. In our text for meditation in verse 6, he writes about Christ's death. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. So as we travel through these weeks of Lent, we provide a timely opportunity to thankfully reflect upon the fact that we have peace with God. It is what verse 1 to 5 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. Knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Friends in Christ, peace is a major theme in Holy Scriptures. It refers to the repair and restoration of a formerly broken relationship. Adam and Eve's disobedience broke their their perfect relationship with our holy creator God. They passed that sin broken relationship down to us through the sin nature that we inherited from them. We daily demonstrated with our countless actual sins of thoughts, attitudes, words, and actions 
that transgress God's law. Because of such, we deserve to be condemned. However, Jesus Christ is, as Isaiah says in chapter 9, verse 6, Prince of Peace, to whom the angels refer when they announce his birth to the shepherds with the heavenly son. Luke 2 14. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. Furthermore, the Apostle Paul tells us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, that the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Because our Lenten Lord give us peace, we glorify God for the hope He gives us. The Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, But now faith, hope, love abide these three. Friends, hope and faith contain the element of confident trust and certain belief. The difference between them is that faith looks back with confident trust and certain belief at what Christ already did for us in the past. Whereas hope looks forward with confident trust and certain belief at what God will do for us in the future. As we now await that future reality, we spend our lives praising God for the hope He gives us. We especially do so by faithfully joining together in public worship and Bible study participation, as well as repentantly partaking of our Lord's body and blood that are really present in with and under the consecrated elements of bread and wine in his holy supper. In addition, we honor God by supporting our Lord's work with generous monetary offerings of thanksgiving that will reverse our deficit cash flow. In addition, that will provide sufficient funds to pay our obligations in a timely and appropriate manner. Another way we glorify God is by becoming personally involved in the life, work, and activities of our congregation. Now, during COVID-19, instead of merely sitting back or complaining, we help other members who are actively help the congregation to pass safely these difficult times. God graciously forgives us all our sins, including our neglect to be as faithful and generous with our time, talents, and treasures as we could and ought. We respond by praising Him for the hope He gives us, and at the same time, we thank God for the tribulations He allows to afflict us. All of us here today, along with you who are watching from home, know along with the Apostle Paul and Jesus Christ Himself the painful reality of trials, tribulations, sickness, headaches, and despair. The words of Paul who says that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, is enormously noteworthy. Its significance lies in an ever-changing reality of God's love for us that He demonstrated through the saving sacrifice of His only begotten Son for us. So, 
Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulations or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer to him who loved us. As strange as it seems to the world around us, and often to ourselves as well, we can and do thank God for the tribulation. He allows to afflict us, knowing that, as Romans 8 verse 28 says, God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. At the same time, he reassures us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. Brothers and sisters in Christ, aware of these blessed assurances, we acknowledge with great gratitude that we have peace with God and we are safe from God's wrath. Verse 9 through 11 says, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Friends, each Sunday, we confess our sins to God and we receive each time his forgiveness. 1 John 1, 7 reassures us this. The blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sins. All of that simply says that Jesus appeased God's righteous wrath over our indignant sin with the shedding of his holy blood on Calvary's cross. Through that self-sacrificial act, God reconciled us to himself. That is, God repaired the relationship with himself that we broke with our sin. He did so with Jesus Christ, by whom he reunites us with himself. Paul, the Apostle Paul, clearly explained this when he wrote to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 13 through 16. But now in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who made both groups into one, and broke down the barrier of the, of the divided wall, by abolishing in his flesh the enmity which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so that in himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, and might reconcile them both in one body to God through the cross, by it put to death the enmity. So my dear friends in Christ, we glorify God for reconciling us to himself. It is the right and proper things to do. God certainly deserves our glory for all that he did and continues to do that makes and keep us in relationship with him through faith in Jesus Christ. The Holy Scripture is full of examples of exhortation for such. I will give you a few example. King David encourages us in Psalm 32 verse 11, Be glad in the Lord and rejoice, 
you righteous ones, and shout for joy, all you who are upright in heart. The prophet Isaiah declared in Isaiah 61 verse 10, I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul will exult in my God. Mary, the mother of Jesus, told Elizabeth in Luke 1 verse 46, 47, My soul exalts the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God, my Savior. The Apostle Peter, who knew personally the abundant mercy and grace of Jesus Christ brought in 1 Peter 1, 8, 9. And though you do not see him, speaking about Jesus Christ, you, don't, don't, you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory. So, my dear friends in Christ, let us glorify God with words that we say and sing, thoughts that we think and ponder, and deeds that we do because we have peace with God and we are saved from God's wrath. Our Lord accurately timed his atoning death when he suffered rejection, persecution, slander, cruel punishment, and wretched crucifixion death to wash away our sins. He also conquered Satan and death itself with his personal resurrection from the dead to gain forgiveness, salvation, and eternal life for all who cling to him by spirit-given faith. Let us now exercise our spirit-given faith by humbly taking up our crosses daily and faithfully following Him. Indeed, the secret to spiritual security and eternal glory is simply losing our life for the sake of Jesus Christ as we devote ourselves to the good news that is anchored in and tells about him alone. God granted all for the sake of Jesus Christ, his humble Son, our Holy Savior. Amen. Let us confess our Christian faith speaking the Apostle Creed. I believe, I believe in God, God the Father Almighty, Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us pray for the Church here and around the world, and for all people in their various circumstances. For the church around the world, all people who join Peter in professing that Jesus is the Christ, that they trust God's purpose for their lives, take up their crosses, and follow, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who spend their lives serving the physical, mental, social, and emotional needs of the people around them, but God bless and guide them according to His gracious purpose. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For professional counselors and private confidence, who alleviate suffering, enable endurance, support character, and encourage hope, that they, that they serve as conduits for God's purposes in the lives of their patients, family, and friends. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those who lead the government of the world, that they find purpose in their 
position, using every means to increase harvest, combat global health crisis, minimize conflict between nations, and ensure equal justice for all their citizens. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those near and dear to us, especially for Eric, for Rob, for Jeff, for Chris, for Martha, for Sylvia, who was chronic kidney failure, for David, for Bill, for Beth, for Vicky, for Pastor James, for Kathleen, for Stacy and Son, for Karen, for Nancy, for Mirja, for Smyra, for Jordan, for Patricia, for Sandra, for Dennis and Sarah, for Doreen, for Grace, for Nancy, Marsha, for Matthew, Nancy, Harry, Mark and Elsie, for Anne and Anne, for Shirley and Keith, for Mark, for Frank, for Sarah, for Alice, for Christina, for Stacy and family, for Deborah, for Bill and Sandy, for Lloyd and Elsie, for Ed, for Walter and Donna, for Anna, for Becky, for John and for Irene, for Susan, for Bogus, for Geraldine, for Anne and Mike, for Rainer, for Marianne and family, for Ritva, for Marcus and Rito, for Lisette and her family, and for those we name in our heart and mind. The God bring about the healing, comfort, freedom, and dignity for which they send requests to our gracious Lord. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all the families of our congregations, especially for Dolores, for John Jr., for Susanna and Kristen, and for the family of David, Michael, and Marianne, that they be united in love and mutual respect. And when there is a strife, contention, or problems, they seek our Heavenly Father for help, forgiveness, peace, and reconciliation through Christ. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those members who are celebrating their birthdays this week, especially for David, Ginevra, for Kira, for Jordan, for Brian, for Natalie, and for Jason, that our merciful Lord protect them and strengthen their trust in His goodness, and He bless them with, with His abiding love all the days of their life, as well for those who are celebrating another year of married life this week. We remember Rob and Kathy that our Lord always opened their hearts to receive more of His love, and their love never grow weary, but deepen and grow to every joy and sorrow shared. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For those who are grieving, those who are troubled, and those who are struggling with difficulties in life, that even when it feels like the Lord has forsaken them, they may trust God's promise that He has not forgotten them, and that our Heavenly Father will take care of them. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For all the members who are part of this congregation of faith and as well as grace, that the Spirit would lead them to cheerful, generous giving from the bounty the Lord provides, to support the church and to help those in need. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. This and any other things you would have asked of you, Heavenly Father, grant to us for the sake of the bitter sufferings and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, heaven hallowed be, be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done God, on earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. bread. And, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.
want to reaffirm you about the presence of God in our life. He promised to be with us, and we trust in His Word. He is with us, helping us during difficult times in our life. We have concluded our worship service this morning, and be with the Lord, and be saved, and see you live streaming on Wednesday. God bless you. Go in peace as you serve the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God.